I'm Chris Dutchko, co-host of the Ninth Grade Experience Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Today I'm talking with Pastor Shell Osman about his awesome book, It's Not Good for Leaders to Lead Alone. Nobody Succeeds Without the Help of Others. Oh, this is such an awesome book. You're going to learn so much. Thanks for listening. Oh, by the way, before you go, you know, there's several ways in which you can help the podcast. And it'd be so cool if you did this. I mean, uh, one of those ways is just tell a friend, you know, just share the links and say, hey, you ought to listen to uh, Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12. That'd be so cool. Uh, another way is to go to my website and leave a review and subscribe. What do you think? That'd be nice. And finally, how about uh, click on the link on my website homepage where it says, buy me a coffee. Uh, by doing this, you could donate a dollar or two to help me address the costs associated with producing the podcast. What do you think? That'd be so nice. I'd love it if you did any of those things. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing. You are awesome. Enjoy the show. Uh, and to assist my leader in uh, in better ways. And so it was during those years that I, I noticed that really every secondary leader has to do his or her part to help that primary leader and the organization to succeed. It's the Education Podcast, your favorite show, with lots of groovy guests, and they share what they know. So crank it up to 10 and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Milletto. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Ah, ah, with Dr. Steve Milletto. My guest today is Pastor Shell Osmond. Shell has been married to Missy since 1986, and they reside in Atlanta Metro. Their sons, SJ, his wife, Tina, and their children, as well as their daughter, Summer Joy, her husband, Gary, and their children, all live in the Atlanta Metro. Since 1986, Shell has served churches in Louisiana and Georgia as a youth pastor, worship leader, business administrator, senior associate pastor, and lead pastor. He has been privileged to serve the Georgia Assemblies of God as the Metro Atlanta Regional Presbyter and as an instructor for the Georgia School of Ministry. He previously served as the Alumni Association President and continues to serve as the Vice Chairman of the Board of Trustees for Beulah Heights University. In his community, Shell has served as a board member for Super Smyrna, First Priority, the City of Smyrna's 10-Year Vision for the Community, and the Smyrna Citizen Corps Council. He currently serves on the Griffin Middle School Counselor Advisory Committee as a chaplain for the Smyrna Fire Department, as the head chaplain for the Smyrna Police Department, as a chaplain to the City of Smyrna employees, as a board member for the Smyrna Public Safety Foundation, as a chaplain for the Smyrna Business Association, and as a spiritual advisor for the Code 7 Foundation. Shell is also a member of the Georgia Association of Law Enforcement Chaplains and is a serving Heroes Certified Chaplain. Shell is the author of It's Not Good for Leaders to Lead Alone, which is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other outlets. And I'll make sure there's connections for that in the show notes. He is also a contributing author to Igniting Revival Fire Every Day. Shell has been featured in several publications, and he's been a guest on a variety of podcasts. Our focus today is Shell's book, It's Not Good for Leaders to Lead Alone. Nobody Succeeds Without the Help of Others. Shell, thanks so much for being on my show, and uh, say hi to everyone. Oh, Dr. Mileto, what a joy it is to be able to join with you today and with your podcast listeners. I've enjoyed our friendship for many, many years, and to join you today is truly a, a wonderful honor of mine. Thank you for the invitation. Well, I'm glad glad you're here. It's awesome to, to connect. We've uh, known each other over the times. You, you you did a long time ago when I was a high school principal. You you introduced <laughs> you and your wife took uh, took me to dinner and and uh, introduced me to something I never ever tried, which was grilled shrimp. <laughs> so <laughs> and I and I loved them. So yeah, <laughs> good. good. Um, you know. Let, Let's start by talking about your role as a pastor. Often a yeah. pastor is thought of as a leader of a congregation, a leader in the community, sure. a voice of guidance, a teacher, and the share of God's word. <laughs> Could you share mm -hmm. a little about the hats that you wear as a pastor? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Mileto. I, I'm thinking back as well on our 20-year friendship. You arrived at that high school, and I arrived at the church where I serve now uh, in the same year. And it wasn't too long after that that we got acquainted. But thank you for your question. I, I know for some people, there may be a little uh, ambiguity as to what a pastor does. You know, some people think we work maybe all day on Sunday and a half a day on Wednesday, and then we play <laughs> golf the rest of the week. <laughs> I'm not even sure I know exactly where my golf clubs are, so I, I don't follow that category. 
But, you know, first of all, before talking about being a pastor, I can just tell you that uh, in addition to being a, a husband, a father of two adult grown children with spouses of their own, and now a grandfather of six, that those are really my most important roles. And uh, as you mentioned, our both our son, our daughter, their spouses, and their kids live locally, and uh, we're grateful to be just minutes away from one another. They're also all very actively involved in our church, so we see them constantly, and uh, that's just a wonderful, wonderful privilege. But uh, I have had the privilege of serving as the lead pastor at Life Church in Smyrna for the past actually more than 20 years, and that's where I focus the majority of my time and energy as far as vocationally. So in that role, I I serve uh, and responsible really for casting the vision for the church. I preach most of the Sunday services. Occasionally, I'll have a guest, or if I'm out on vacation or sickness or something, one of my staff members or somebody will fill in. But we have a staff of um, 11 employees, and so I'm responsible for daily administrating, you know, as a supervisor or a boss, if you will. Uh, pastor, I guide the board of six other elected individuals from our congregation who comprise our official board. We uh, oversee and manage the ultimately the finances and all of those uh, responsibilities as board members. And then I, I want to help to ensure the quality of all the ministries that we offer at our church and through our church. So I often say this to our congregation, you know, everything that happens here at Life Church may not be my fault but it's all my responsibility. So, nice. You know, I just want to make sure that, that I'm hands on, but not uh, too hands on. I've got a great staff of gifted and talented people and uh, they do a wonderful job. So I want to just oversee that and, and help um, uh, maybe give some guidance there. And so then also want to provide um, and just, keep us focused strongly on our, on our community. You, you referenced about the high school where you were and we developed what we call a community partnership with you guys in those days. It's continued now till 2024. So about 20 years or so now we love serving our community and kind of like as neighbors, uh, we just like to find organizations that we can say, Hey, we're both here in the area. If you have a need and we could meet it, we'd love to do that. And so we just love, helping other organizations succeed. And then we have a strong focus on, uh, on uh, make, uh, excuse me, having a global impact through our missions ministry and our endeavors from digging water wells all across Africa or providing food and clothing and shelter, uh, education to impoverished parts of the world and to children, and certainly sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a big part of it. And then, as you mentioned, outside the church, I have the privilege of serving as the chaplain for several organizations, and we just like um, the privilege of being, a, and I do in particular as a pastor, uh, and a friend to people outside of our church. And so those are, those are, I guess, kind of the primary responsibilities that I carry uh, as a pastor, and then as an extension of that role. Awesome. Appreciate it. I, you know, one of the things uh, I'll never forget is that, you know, because I, I, I know over the years I've had colleagues who they don't know how to really approach the idea of being partners with a church. And, right. uh, and uh, you guys are awesome. <laughs> it's uh, and shy away from uh, um, any, any way that from helping families in the community to uh, look, looking and helping out the school. And uh, like I reached out to you and you let, gave me some space in the, in the, church itself to meet with my leadership team and it Absolutely. actually taught a, taught, taught a couple lessons to leadership lessons, I, which was cool. I so. did. In fact, I pulled up those notes from all those years ago and I was looking through them and I was almost embarrassed. I'm like, wow, y'all tolerated that. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. We, we do. We, we are very aware uh, in particular talking about schools of uh, some of the lines that we need to, to walk very carefully. And we've always, honored those. What I've shared with other principals, uh, and perhaps with you back in the day, as I said, you know, we're not asking you to let us do inside your building or with your students what we do at our church. We're just saying as a neighbor, if you have a need and we could help meet it, we'd love to do it. We don't need the publicity. We're not looking for accolades. We just want a chance to maybe help lighten your load a little bit. And uh, I'll tell you, Dr. Maletto, uh, principals all across our area have just embraced us and allowed us to do that. And um, we've been able to hopefully be a good neighbor to other organizations. And it's been our joy to, to meet some needs and to, again, maybe make their load just a little bit lighter. Oh, and you definitely did all that and are still doing, which is awesome. Well, so. thank you, sir. All right. So uh, before we go any further, 
I got to say this because we're getting ready to delve mm-hmm. into your book. Your book is dedicated to your father. Could you share a right. few a few thoughts about your father? Oh goodness, how long did you say we had? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> my dad, uh, though he passed away in 2015, has been all of my life and continues to be uh, my hero, my forever hero. Uh, while he wasn't a perfect man, certainly my dad was a, a really good man, and I would say from a, a faith perspective, a very godly man. He showed me and my two brothers, I have an older and a younger brother, how to love our wives, how to raise our kids, how to be a good member of society. Uh, taught us so many lessons by his life that just have permeated into my life and certainly into my brother's lives as well. Uh, you know, it's it's been said that sometimes Parents and their children can't work together, uh, but my dad and I had the I had the privilege I would say of working with my dad for several years, and uh, just loved every minute of that. He owned a furniture and appliance business, among several things. He's an entrepreneur, a businessman, a wonderful, wonderful guy. And in one of his businesses, I had the opportunity to manage a furniture and appliance business with him, and so every day, uh, six days a week, we were together. And just enjoyed that. Uh, And again, part of the reason is because he's my hero. Uh, And then in 2013, I I grew up in Louisiana. My parents lived there. um, Well, dad, really all of his life. My mom's originally from South Georgia, but she met dad in Louisiana. And that's where they married and raised the family. But um, dad and mom's health were failing and we moved them closer to us in 2013 and dad, dad made it a couple more years till 2015 and mom 2017. But, you know, I've thought at times I'll talk about my dad and there's always a scripture for me that comes to mind and it's uh, from the book of Proverbs. And it says a good name is to be chosen more than great riches. And I'll just tell you with, with respect to my, to my parents, but in particular, my dad, they didn't leave my brother and I great riches, but they left us a great name. I could go back home now. And if I met someone and said, Hey, I'm Shell Osmond. And they go, Osmond, Osmond, it's your dad, Billy Osmond. I said, yeah, well, you know, and then they'll launch into this story about how, when he was maybe with JC Penney's sold him a washing machine and they got it home and something wasn't working and he came over personally and fixed it for him or what, or some other business venture that he was in or his involvement in the community. Or they'll say, Osmond, Joyce, is that your mom? And they'll talk about her years working at what's now the university of Louisiana at Monroe. And uh, I'm just grateful to have a good name. I, I've never had to hang my head in shame when I, when I mentioned my name and that's in particular for my, my mom and my dad, but dad, uh, throughout his life, I could climb up in his lap if he can still hold me and just kiss him on his cheek and tell him how much I love him. He's really my, my number one hero. Thank you so much for sharing. That's awesome. That is so cool. Yeah, Good stuff. I, all right. So let's get into your book. Okay. It's, it's called, it's not good for leaders to lead alone. Nobody succeeds without the help of others. So yes, what, what inspired you to write this book? You know, I would say the book really is a culmination of things that I have hopefully learned and am still learning. <laughs> Certainly not there. Going back to uh, probably out of high school when uh, I went to work for uh, the Coca-Cola company, I was a route salesman for about 14 months and then moved into uh, management with them for about another three years. And then uh, working, as I mentioned, with my father in his business. And then for the first 17 years and of being in the ministry and been in ministry actually now over 37 years, but for the first 17, 18 years, I served in a variety, and you mentioned it from my bio, in in associate pastoral roles, whether it was a youth pastor or worship leader or business administrator, those types of roles, and just began to, uh, during especially those years, I would say, kind of jot down thoughts and ideas of, of things that I felt like were important for me as a secondary leader in that organization, meaning whether it's the business or um, in the ministry, not being that primary leader who's ultimately responsible for that organization. Just things that I began to to pick up on that I felt like helped me to serve uh, and to assist my leader in uh, in better ways. And so it was during those years that I, I noticed that really every secondary leader has to do his or her part to help that primary leader and the organization to succeed. 
And so as I was looking through those thoughts and principles, and then certainly uh, one of the guiding forces in my life is the Bible. And as I'm reading through the Bible, suddenly I'm kind of picking up parallels of things from the business world and from ministry and looking at scripture and seeing that so much about leadership really can be found within the pages of uh, both the old and the new Testament, as we tend to call them and just begin to formulate those thoughts. And ultimately, gosh, it probably was a journey of about, I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 years of jotting down thoughts and ideas that finally I got to the place. And my wife certainly kept encouraging me, honey, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. And others were very kind. And finally it, it came into fruition and it's the copy that you now hold in your hand. And, and I've been grateful to be able to finish it and kind of check that off of my list of something that I wanted to do. And so I have great admiration, always have for authors, but now that, now that I are one, now that I am one, I, say, man, is that what everybody goes through? So that's kind of the backstory of the book. And things that I learned, picked up, wanted to help other leaders maybe learn and to implement in their organization so that they could do a better job as the primary leader and their organization could succeed. That's awesome. I, you know, it's uh, when, when we first met, and you know, I was a high school principal and in the right. community where your church is, and you did mm-hmm. a powerful workshop with my assistant principals mm-hmm. and myself. Thank you. And, oh, it was cool. And uh, I, I, I'll never forget, because you asked me, you know, should I separate out all the, you know, the, the church world stuff? And I said, yeah. I said no, because it fits. And it does. It, it, it does. Right. I mean, everything you're talking about, uh, um, it's very much so. It's uh, very much so fits. And, you know, one of the things uh, that you uh, um, got into in that uh uh, in, in chapter three really sticks out uh-huh. loud and clear here, which is your chapter three is titled, do you help carry your leader's load? And you right. say, and you say this, no other person on the team carries a load that even comes close to that, which the primary leader must carry. All right. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about what you're talking about here. Sure. Thank you. Um, having been in those uh, secondary leadership roles for all of those years, um, I want to think that I was as aware as I possibly could be of the load that my primary leader was carrying. But now that I've been a primary leader for these past 20 years in in our church in particular, I now realize I probably was clueless. (laughs) I I may have had some inclination, a little bit of insight. And because I worked so closely with those people and, and we shared a lot of personal time, even outside of those organizations, um, I was aware of some of the things that they were carrying, but there's just no way I don't think that I, as a secondary leader, could have possibly fully envisioned what they were carrying. Because I do believe that while many secondary leaders in any organization, whether it's a church or a school or a business, may know more about their area than their primary leader, perhaps. I mean, there's specializations that uh, every primary leader has not walked in those paths, so we got to give got to give credence to that. And while there may be some others in that organization who actually work more hours than that primary leader, I think that's probably arguable. But nevertheless, maybe on the clock they are there for more hours. At the end of the day, I don't think anyone other than that primary leader carries the load for the health and the wellness of that organization like the primary leader does. I'll just put this on me. I won't put it on anybody else. But when I left the office as a staff member or from my dad's business or with Coca-Cola, I wasn't focused on all of the things that they were focused on. I wasn't as concerned about sales in my father's business being up or down as he was because he was the guy who carried that weight. I just did my part and did my job. And then as a pastor, I wasn't worried about all the things that he was worried about because I was just focused on my area. And I think that's what happens with secondary leaders is sometimes we're so tunnel vision on, I've got to do my part. I've got to get these jobs done. I got to get these reports out or finish these assignments. If we're not careful, we're overlooking the fact that there's somebody in that organization who, when we leave and go home, even though they may have left and gone home, it's still on their mind in a deeper way than it is or maybe the secondary leaders, we get a chance to clock out, but I don't think the primary leader really ever clocks out. In fact, Cardinal Gibbons, the Archbishop of Baltimore, once said, there are no office hours for leaders. And I would say, for me, in these last 20 years, 
um, leading our church and then being involved in the other organizations, they're constantly on my mind. If I'm not physically working on those things, those things are constantly on my mind. On my mind, my wife is my administrative assistant, and there are times where we'll tell each other on a date, on a vacation, okay, all right, honey, let's not talk about the church at all or the chaplaincy or all these things. And then within five or ten minutes, one of us is going to bring it up because we love it so much, and it's always on our mind. It's always in our hearts. We're always thinking about maybe it's a parent who has a teenager who's really struggling uh, maybe it's a couple in our church that are going through a rough time, and I've been able to counsel with them and pray with them. And so on the off hours, I'm wondering, well, how are Mary and Bob doing, or how's how are the Smiths and their kid, or whatever? So it's just, it's. I think it's different. I'm not saying that it's necessarily more important than, but I certainly think it's different. And I don't know that anybody in the organization carries the load quite like the primary leader. It, it, and it's so right on the money. That is something that, and I think, you know, one of the um, one of the lessons that I'll never forget then, and you, you bring it up in a uh, way in your book, that uh, is that sometimes we have to be careful as secondary leaders because uh, um, people can start uh, telling you how wonderful you are. And if you, <laughs> <laughs> you listen yeah. to all of that, uh, with, <laughs> you, you might uh, put yourself in a new place. So, <laughs> yeah. That's true. That's true. Reminds me, if you don't mind me sharing this little story, at one of the churches over these years where I've served in those associate roles, I would uh, occasionally and, and fairly often have an opportunity to preach. Uh, if my pastor was out of town or vacation or sick or whatnot, he would oftentimes call on me, or maybe he was there and it was just an opportunity he had given me, and I was always grateful for that. And uh, there was one gentleman in that particular church that would almost without fail catch me after the service and walk up to me. And, and I know right now on our podcast, people can't see what you and I are seeing on, on this call, but he would kind of look around and make sure nobody else was listening. And he would say something like, you know, I got to tell you, I'd rather hear you preach than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> now for me, that on the surface, that almost sounds like a compliment, but for me, I never did like that. And I would tell him, listen, if you want to, I appreciate your kindness, but here's who you need to thank. You need to go thank that man right over there, my pastor, for even giving me the privilege of being in the pulpit today. I want to make sure that as a secondary leader that I kept my mind right and kept my heart right because it wasn't about me. Uh, that man had just given me an opportunity, and I, I felt really uncomfortable about that, even though I appreciated his kind words. It was just always kind of masked with something that made me really uncomfortable. So you're right. We got we to gotta watch our heads and watch our hearts for sure. Well, that's always stuck with me because it's, it's <laughs> something that I think uh, lots of uh, aspiring leaders have to – they have to – Think about that, and it, it, yeah. it and it, whether it's you know, whatever their role is, it's uh, if they're a secondary leader that it's important. Which leads me to you know one of the thing, one of the chapters. And by the way, for my listeners, I, I mean I'm not going to go through chapter by chapter. You got to buy his book, all right? You got to buy his book, I and mean, it's it's awesome. But the uh, oh, thank you, Doc. Oh, you're welcome. The uh, chapter five is called, uh -huh. do, do you support your leader's vision? And you say this, within the scope of church ministry, there may be no single issue as potentially divisive as when a staff member struggles with trying to fulfill his vision versus fulfilling the pastor's vision. Right. Why is this an issue? Well, I, I appreciate the question. And, and I did, as you quoted in that particular part, uh, and for your listeners, I would, I would want to just maybe offer a little bit of clarity while I my primary focus as vocationally is that of a pastor. The book's written in such a way that I think it will, and I hope it will, uh, have application outside of the church settings. And so there are, because that's the world in which I primarily live, there are examples that I use that talk about in ministry. But I believe in a real way, all truth runs parallel. It's kind of like uh, the two rails that a train rides on, they got to be parallel to one another or some, something's going to come off the track. Right. And so while I believe that some of the examples that I share certainly come from my life and times in ministry, the application of even the, the question, will you help fulfill your leader's vision, is applicable outside of church. It's in any organization, the school where you serve, banks and businesses, things of that nature. So for me, though, to your question, I don't think that what 
I address in that particular portion happens all at once. I think more likely it begins to happen over uh, a period of time. And going back to the example I just used of the guy saying, man, I'd rather hear you preach than anybody else. You know, that, that kind of puffs you up, kind of makes you feel good. Uh, you think, wow, that's, that's nice. But things like that, I would say, um, are, can be the impetus for ultimately what results in division within that organization. For example, as an associate pastor, if I felt like the direction that our church was going in, maybe pastor launched some vision for the new year or some initiative that we were going to move into or some focus for a new building that we were going to build or something, anything like that. And I thought we ought to go in a different direction. You know, vision is what we see or what we want to see. Division is when we have two visions. And to again, quote from Scripture, Jesus said, and I'll paraphrase it, but any house, any nation, any business, any kingdom, any family, any church, any school, any organization that's divided will not stand. You know, people can disagree. Spouses disagree. Employers and employees disagree. Disagreements are not necessarily problematic. The division is what becomes problematic. And so when there's division in that organization between a secondary leader saying, well, I think we ought to go this way, and the primary leader saying, I believe we ought to go this way, I think in that moment, that's a good opportunity for that secondary leader to say, I think I need to find another place to work. Because if I stay here and I try to drive my vision as if it's more important than the primary leader's vision, then we're not going to have just a disagreement. We're going to have division. And I think there are practical examples. There are certainly biblical examples of the tragedies that exist within that organization, within that family, within that institution, when the two rails aren't running parallel to one another. That's so so important to understand. And I, I, I think you just bring it to a good point right there and in the book. And, and you know, it's, it's something that uh, um, I, I just – there are forces that are constantly trying to tear the team apart. <laughs> yes, sir. Always, always. And that's and you, you do a great job of bringing that to uh, mind here. Make uh, you know the reader think about that type of situation and such that they might be in or you know might currently be in where someone's yes. whispering in their ear that it's, could be right now. Yes, sir. Direction. Could be. And you know, I, I, not I am far, far, far from perfect. I mentioned my dad wasn't perfect. I'm his son. I'm even less perfect. I'm sure that he was. But there were times in those associate roles, whether it was in my dad's business, working for those years with Coca-Cola, being in ministry, that, you know, I, I would have to fight that internally. Hopefully it never surfaced externally to where anybody else saw it. But there were certainly times that I didn't agree with every decision that was made. I, I don't know that that's even reasonable to expect our our team to always agree with everything. Again, disagreements, I don't think, sync organizations families, businesses, churches, division sinks those organizations, those families, those businesses, those churches. And so that's the part that in that chapter, I wanted to hopefully help us all to stay focused on, okay, if I can't support that leader's vision, then maybe, not maybe, but it really is time for me to go somewhere else because to stay, I think would become problematic. There would be that tension that exists between your way or my way. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I think that it would be becumbent upon secondary leaders to say, maybe it's time for me to just find a new place to work, to serve, whatever. So important. So important. I, Thank you, sir. You know, one of the things I got to point out is that uh, I want to look at the formatting of your book for a minute. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. um, because at the end of each chapter, you have a gray box. that has three segments. Uh -huh. One's right. called reflect, receive, and the, and the last one's respond. Could you share why you included this section? Cause I love it. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would say as a communicator, and that's a large portion of what I do as a pastor, whether it's preaching a sermon or leading devotions or whatever, that's communication is at the core of almost everything that I do. I know that in particular, I, as a communicator, have a tendency to be extremely verbose. You've asked me some very short questions, and my answers have been really verbose. And I, what I wanted to do in the book is to present those. And you notice, other really than the opening chapter, 
which was entitled a, an Olympic size uh, vision. Uh, I, I talked about, or lesson, I should say. I, I tried to title each chapter as a question that provokes the thoughts of, you know, will you carry your leader's vision? Are you content with your calling or your position in the organization? And then as I shared my thoughts, as verbose or as brief as they were, I then hopefully wanted to encourage the reader to just pause and process through that on their own. And so whether it was reflecting back on something or, you know, what do you feel like you received from this chapter? And then how are you going to respond to it? I wanted them to put themselves into that chapter and turn off my voice or the people that I quoted and just sit and and ponder, okay, I've just read this. Now, what does this mean to me? How can I grow? How can my organization grow? How do I need to respond? What do I need to tweak in my life? And so to me, it was it was the just the thought provoking part of the each chapter that I wanted to, to maybe initiate for the reader. Well, that's awesome. And I love it. It's uh, you know, you, it makes you then, you know, reflect back on what you were doing, what you just read and uh, how it might impact you and how you might put it in action. I, and I love it. So good stuff. I, you know, one of the, um, one of my favorite chapters, and by the way, oh, I've, okay. I've learned not to ask, authors to tell me their uh-huh. favorite chapter because usually they say something like oh i can do that it's it's like choosing your favorite <laughs> child or something and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so instead i choose my sure. favorite <laughs> there you go thank, well thank you for that you're welcome um one of my favorite chapters is eight uh-huh. will, will you go the extra mile all right mm. so tell everybody what you mean oh okay all right you you might remember it if you don't it's okay but in the formatting of the book i tried to quote other folks with statements they had made, I felt, I felt like that were applicable to that particular chapter. And, and I remember in chapter eight, I quoted Napoleon Hill who once said, the man who does more than he is paid for will soon be paid for more than he does. And for me, associating that with the question of that chapter, will you go the extra mile is for me in a very practical way. I think what Hill is saying, he's kind of summing up the chapter that I wanted to encourage those secondary leaders to say, in essence, yes, I have a job description. And yes, it's as clear or it's as vague as I've been given. But I know when I get to work today, I pretty much know what's expected of me. Some things we do daily. Sometimes we do them occasionally. Sometimes they're monthly or quarterly or annual things that we have to do within our organizations. But for me, I wanted to encourage secondary leaders to ask themselves, will I be willing to go beyond that, whatever the that is, to help my organization succeed? Ultimately, the success of that organization is that secondary leader's success as well. I mean, think about it. If the organization fails, then they're out of a job or they're, they got to start going somewhere else. The company's downsizing or right sizing or whatever we want to call it. So they're vested in that organization's success And yet still, if all any of us ever do is the very minimum of what's expected of us, then that organization, I don't think, will ever really flourish to the degree that it possibly can. And that's what I love about Napoleon Hill's statement of, if you'll do more than you're getting paid for, one day you're going to get paid for, for doing more than what you're actually doing. Your value in that organization will only increase as you're willing to do more to help the organization to succeed. Now, I'll share this quickly. I, for 20 years as, as a lead pastor, when I've handed a job description, I'm going over it with a potential employee, somebody that I'm onboarding. I'll always say this to them as we walk through the job description. I've already sent it to them. They looked it over. But now we're just kind of freewheeling through that, through that part of the conversation. I say, now, I need to tell you this. On the last page at the bottom, in invisible ink, it says, and anything else I'm asked to do. Nice, nice. (laughs) I said, because we work here as a team, and there are going to be times that things that I'm doing, you're doing, we're all doing, don't fit real neatly in our job description. They certainly don't fit real neatly into what we're passionate about doing, but they're things that just need to be done to help this organization, that is our church or wherever I'm serving, to succeed and move forward. And so, you know, I think, Pretty much everybody understands that, but if we're not careful, there'll be times where we stall in those moments and we'll feel like, 
I'm the only one who's ever going the extra mile or whatever. I've been told, and I don't know this from the inside out, but I've been told that Chick-fil-A has that as one of their uh, corporate mottos and philosophies about second, I think they call it second mile, second service. Um, and it comes really from a, a, a biblical example of when Jesus was talking with his followers, and he says, if somebody asks you to go or compels you actually to go one mile, be willing to go too. And he's saying that to them in the context of as Jewish individuals, Rome had taken over Israel and was ruling Israel. And he's saying, even if those guys, pointing to, I kind of see the Roman soldiers, people that don't believe like us, act like us, maybe live like us, whatever the story was behind the story, he's saying, when they tell you to go a mile, be willing to go too. He then goes on to say, if somebody asks for your coat, give them your cloak also. So that to me, as a follower of Christ, is that calling that I think we all carry. But even if someone doesn't share my faith, our faith, I still believe for the health of that organization, every secondary leader needs to be committed to going the second mile. You can use the biblical principle, you can quote Jesus if you want to, or just say, I got to do more to help my organization succeed. And if so, then that's success for that organization. That's so awesome. That is, you know, Thank you, sir. and I, I love that message and it uh, comes across just right. And it's, and it's something that I, I think a lot of, a lot of people have missed that thought sometimes, and I and mm-hmm. I think it needs to be reminded. Uh, and they need to read read those words. But thank you for uh, thank del- you delivering that message. I, you know, chapter thirteen asks, "Will you serve with excellence?" And so now we oh, go an- mm-hmm. another level. Um, right. So why mm-hmm. is that important? Because sometimes you know th- there used to be a commercial by Honda that said, "It's okay," you know, and that's. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it kind of reminds me, if you don't mind, I think I think it was AT&T, one of the phone companies many, many years ago, had a commercial that said long distance is the next best thing to being there, saying, if you can't be there, then use our phone service to make a long distance call and pay us all the money for you to talk to that person. <laughs> and I kind of get that. But you mentioned about there are those forces that are always pulling within the organization to go different directions, to succeed, to fail, or whatnot. So for me, for excellence, I, I think it's kind of best defined as the quality of being outstanding or extremely good. You know, there are always um, these award shows that sometimes we watch on television for musicians and actors and actresses or whatever, what in whatever field they're in. <clears throat> you know, we're recording this post-Super Bowl. And Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl again, and somebody's going to be the MVP of the of the game and all that kind of stuff. Those are people who are not acknowledged, whether they're Grammy Award winners or they're, or they're uh, most valuable player on the sports team or whatever. They're not acknowledged for just showing up and being okay. They're acknowledged for going above and beyond. They've moved into what, in the context of this chapter, I'm referring to as excellence. They may not be the best in the world, <laughs> but they they have been singled out as being noted for their achieving excellence in their field or in that particular area. And so I know every time a primary leader hires a secondary leader, he or she's really hoping that that, that, that new member of their team is going to serve and perform their duties with excellence, or they wouldn't have ever hired them. But how many times have we been surprised as primary leaders? <laughs> your, your listeners can't see the look on your face, so I'll interpret <laughs> what I just saw. <laughs> there are times we've done our homework, we've done our background, we've checked their resume, we've called their references, we've done all these things we've interviewed, and then they get within the organization. And maybe for the first 30, 60, 90, 120 days, whatever it is, man, they're like running like stallions. And then all of a sudden it's like, Man, what happened? It's like a, a switch gets flipped or something, and they've lost that zeal or that passion. So I've been at our church 20 years now. Look, the day I got there, I had thoughts and ideas, dreams and visions and all that kind of stuff. Much of that still drives me to this day, and I'm 20 years older. I'm 20 years <laughs> into this. But, you know, I still want to do the best that I can. Uh, I believe And I don't want to say for your listeners, I I do. I may have referenced her. I respect the fact everybody doesn't share my faith, 
Um, that's not what this is about. It, this is not about whether someone shares my faith. This is about helping organizations to succeed. Yes, some of the principles that I share come from Scripture, but every organization is comprised of the exact same thing, regardless of their vision, their mission, their purpose, and it's people. People are what make the organization successful to a greater or lesser degree. And I just would like to hope that somehow, as somebody picks up this book, reads a chapter, shares it with somebody else, maybe that organization could come, could become a little more successful. If so, then that's a win for me. And so I think serving with excellence requires us all to be honest about ourselves. Am I doing the best that I can? And if not, how can I change that so that I could be a better employee better secondary leader and our organization could be better off. Yeah, so awesome. I love it. And and yes, you interpreted my face r- right, by the way. I was like, <laughs> that, that, We've all started in that movie as, as yeah. leaders, I promise you. <laughs> yes, you're like, okay, that was a mistake. All right, we got to. Um, We're going to have to adjust here. Yes, and there you go. That's Because yeah, I, I think some people, I, I go back to that Honda commercial because it, right. it was just cool. It showed a factory where uh, the, the animated characters were just stamping okay in this metal and, and that's how it's okay. and they just did it over and over and over again and and oh. uh, and the, the the point of the commercial was you know what if what if we yeah. focused on doing better and uh trying exactly. to achieve the impossible and stuff like this instead of being okay with okay <laughs> and <laughs> and this is not a commercial for honda but at the same time it was such yeah. an it was such an awesome point and it fits so well with what you're talking about because i think i think sometimes we get you know some Sometimes people get caught up in the it's okay world. It's like, it's right. like, no, man, keep, keep pushing. We get, yeah. We can do you mentioned, if I might jump in briefly, that I've, I've taught in um, uh, the Georgia School of Ministry. It's a, it's a ministry school that uh, we've offered for quite a few years through our fellowship known as the Assemblies of God. And uh, the textbook that I've used, uh, and I quote Dr. Calvin Miller, the author of this particular book, 10 Keys to Servant Leadership. Um, he cites research, and I don't have it in front of me, so I know I won't get this exactly correct, so everybody forgive me for misquoting Dr. Miller or even his original source. But he talks about that somewhere around 25% of the American workforce say that they just barely do enough to keep their job. 50% admit they don't work as hard as they used to. 75% or again, the statistics may be inaccurate from what I'm quoting, but Uh, say that they're uh, just, you know, they're not living up to their fullest expectations, something like that. And it just paints a picture of the American workforce that is affecting every organization, that there are so many people who are acknowledging, I'm not doing the best that I know that I could be doing. And I would say as a result, that organization is, is, is not succeeding as much as it could. I've got friends that are that own restaurants, and I've heard this so many times. And at least in the restaurant world, there's a saying: if you have time to lean, you have time to clean. Nice, nice. Which means if you're not serving a table, you're not cooking food. You got time to be doing something else. Well, that that person with the perspective of that's not my job, or I'm just going to do just enough to keep my job, they're not going to move into that area of excellence. They're just going to be mediocre or do the very least that they can do. And I'm, I'm convinced they'll never be going back to the whole Napoleon Hills growth. They'll probably never be paid for do, for more than what they're actually doing. They're just going to be paid for the minimum that they're doing. And I just think life is too short to live like that. I think our organizations are too important to, to work like that. So that's that's my call in that chapter is let's, let's do what we do with excellence. Love it. Love it. It's awesome. Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right. So like a lot of, the authors that I ask, you know, what's your favorite? And they say they can't pick one. Well, I had that problem too. So, cause <laughs> so, so even though I said the other one was my favorite, I have two favorites. All right. <laughs> okay. That's good. And, and so if I can be allowed to have another favorite. It's chapter. You can. S- Thank you. Yes, we're friends. You can. Cool. It's, it's chapter 16. And it's okay. it, the question is, do you invest in your growth? Mm-hmm. So why should a team member care about learning more or expanding their knowledge base? Wow. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I think, for one, it, it if we don't do it for the sake of anyone else, let's do it for our own sake. Let's acknowledge that none of us, I'll, I'll, I'm at the front of this line, by the way, none of us know everything 
about the job that we've been asked, hired, appointed, whatever, to do. And so there's always more to learn. I, I say this regularly. All we know is what we know. That's me, that's you, that's all of us. I, you very graciously said I could call you by your first name earlier, and I, I said thank you, but I probably won't. That for me is an acknowledgement of where you have applied yourself and you've attained to the degree that you have, something that I'm hoping to finish a, a, a doctorate one of these days. But nevertheless, I have deep admiration for you. Well, everybody doesn't have a doctorate. Everybody doesn't have a terminal degree. Everybody's not going to be the primary leader. But you know what? Wherever we are in this point in our life, if we'll be honest, all we know is what we know. I tend to believe that a lot of times we don't pay people. Let's let's say our, our vehicle needs to be repaired. We don't just pay somebody to repair the vehicle for what they did. We pay them for what they know or what they knew how to do. If we knew how to do it, and if we had the time, if we had the tools, we might do it ourselves and save that money. And sometimes in our organizations, we're paying people and hiring them for what they know how to do. And then we're expecting them to actually do that. So if I, as a as an employee in an organization, will expand my knowledge and commit to my own growth, then ultimately, one of a couple of things I think can happen. That organization can benefit from my additional knowledge because now I know more about my particular field or increasing my knowledge and, and being committed to my own personal growth might actually equate to me getting a promotion in that organization. It might open up a door to working somewhere else. Uh, and so I think investing in our own personal growth and listen, that could be uh, certainly could be academics. It could be, the uh, skills that we need in our particular job. Uh, it could be intellectual knowledge. It could be physical capabilities that we need to expand. It might be some extra tools that we need to do the job more efficiently that allows us to, again, serve with excellence. That investment in our personal growth, I think, ultimately can pay off in personal benefits. But even if it doesn't, even if, I, if I'm in the same job for the rest of my life, if I can do my job better, then ultimately my organization is better and hopefully will experience more growth. I think sometimes we get stuck in a particular phase or a place of our lives simply because we don't want to invest, invest excuse me, in our own personal growth. And I think that's a limiting factor personally, and I certainly think it's a limiting factor for the organization. That is awesome. I I love your book. This is uh, – Thank you. Thank uh, you. It really uh, hits on uh, on just some poignant – aspects of leadership that are uh, so necessary to understand and think about. And you know, as we're getting ready to finish up, if someone wanted to follow up and connect with you, Shell, uh, and, and maybe learn more, where would you send them? Well, uh, they can visit shellosbon.com, and I'll spell it for your listeners. My first name is S-H-E-L-L. Last name Osbon, O S B O N dot com, Shell Osbon dot com. And from there, then it would take them to uh, our church page where there's additional information. Uh, they can look for me by my name on, uh, well, it used, it used to be Twitter, now it's X. Sorry about that. Uh, on X, on uh, Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on all these social media places. Uh, certainly they can visit our church website again, primarily. That's my, that's my main focus, which is Life Church Smyrna and Smyrna is S-M-Y-R-N-A dot com. Um, but yeah, welcome to reach out. Your listeners, if they want to reach out to you, you could, you could share with them any other contact information for me that you have. And uh, if they come through you, I'll trust you to point them to me in any way you'd like. Doc. Well, I appreciate that. And, uh, and I'll have that information in the show notes, so it's easy for them to go f go find you and hook up with you, as well as uh, information about where to pick up your book. So, well, good, thank you, sir. Good stuff. Last question for you goes like this: yeah. uh, It's a question I like to ask my guests, and it's, "Do you have a teacher in your past who made a difference in your life? If so, who was it, and what would you say if given a chance to say thank you?" Oh wow, that is a that is a great question, and I have had many, many amazing, wonderful teachers throughout my years, both. You know, and I think back, this is like, feels like 100 years ago, elementary, middle school. I mean, I'm so old, man. It was called junior high school when I was there. <laughs> now called middle school, <laughs> elementary, middle school, high school. And then through my years in college and then through a master's degree, I, I think of, you know, all of those folks through all of those years of schooling. And um, 
there's a guy that for me, Dr. Mileto, that and I'm going to try not to be emotional, that really rises to the surface. And uh, it's Coach Andy Jackson. Uh, Coach Jackson came to our uh, junior high, as it was called then, in school, and became our head basketball coach. And I, I played basketball through uh, junior high, high school, and, and uh, then beyond that, you know, just for fun. But um, Coach Jackson came to our school, and he just began to pour himself into the lives of these young boys. And I'll be honest, I, you know, usually coaches uh, also teach something. I, I, I don't remember if he taught any classes. I don't think I had any of his classes. If he did, maybe been a PE coach or something. I don't know. But anyway, he, his focus and his influence in my life was primarily in the area of basketball. And he just, he instilled within us some things that for me, and I'm sure others as well, have carried on into my life. He used to say things like this, any team can beat any team on any day. Any team can beat any team on any day. He said, "Sometimes in basketball, you just need a you just need a uh, uh, to have a, a good turnover, or you need a, a a beneficial call by the referee, something that goes in your favor." And he just wanted us to know, as young boys, don't give up on yourself. Don't believe that you can't do it. And he would say, "If you believe that other team's going to beat you, you're already defeated before you get on the basketball court." Things like that, and you know, I. I Coach Jackson has continued living in Louisiana, and we've been here in Atlanta for 28 years, but uh, moved away from that northeast Louisiana area where he was our junior high basketball coach. He went on into uh, school administration and into uh, the local school system administration after he got out of coaching. But uh, Coach Jackson and I reconnected quite a few years ago, and um, in talking with him, um, I had the privilege of flying him out one weekend and having him in a Sunday morning service with us at Life Church. And I just wanted our people and I wanted my family to get to know this guy that they hear me quote so often and that I talk about as such a, an influence in my life. And uh, I have a, a picture of uh, Coach Jackson picked up a copy of my book and he sent me a picture holding my book. And he is he's gotten older since those days and I have to. But I'll just tell you, Coach Jackson is the guy for me that rises to the top. And I don't say that to exclude all the many others who had a tremendous influence. But for whatever reason, in those formulative years of my life, um, he's the guy that stepped into my world that helped me to believe in myself and believe what we could do as a team. And, um, you know, uh, I just will always be grateful to Coach Jackson as well as all the others who poured into my life. That is awesome. I appreciate it. Uh, Thank Shel, you for asking. I'm glad you got a chance to share. That's so cool. That's, yeah. uh, that's neat when it, it, someone has an impact like that. And I'll uh, have to send him a link to this podcast. So please. Make sure he hears me giving him credit. There you go. Love that, you, Coach Jackson. That would be cool. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Uh, yeah, Shell, thank you so much for sharing your book. It's not good for leaders thank to you. lead alone. Nobody succeeds without the help of others. You know, what a powerful book. And every leader, you know, primary and secondary and all of them in different fields need to read your thoughts. Uh, wish Thank you, you, sir. Wish you the best in all you do. You as well. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right here. The opinions expressed on Teaching Learning Leading K-12 are those of the guests and host. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.